Hello everyone, welcome to Snyder's Inc. Today, we're going to be doing I miss the ball in the action. I'm going to keep doing these. Uh, for people who get mad that I take credit, taking credit quotations, um, or quotations stealing his work, and all that, who say the bad things about me reacting to Mr. Ballin. Get a life. I have permission. I asked them on social media. I got permission. Y'all need to freaking relax. Y'all need to relax. This guy is a phenomenal storyteller. He is phenomenal at what he does. And I'm happy to react to his storytelling. I have never acted thing. I don't say it in my video. I don't do shit like that. So you all need to relax. Get your ass in gear. And if you're complaining about that, shut the fuck up. Now this is the last time I'm going to bring it up. Your comment, stupid thing like that, your comment will probably be deleted. Not going to lie. But this is the last time I'm going to bring up these stupid people who do say and comment stupid things. Now, this video is titled The Weirdest Mur Murder Motive Ever Solved Mysteries Episode 3. This is going to be very interesting. Very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Are you guys ready? Of course you're ready. Let's go. finally solved this murder was right in front of everyone the whole time, but it would take almost a decade and the intervention of a secret crime-solving society for investigators to finally understand its disturbing significance. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please recrust the like buttons, Smuckers Uncrustables. Also, please subscribe to our channel channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our video uploads. Alright, let's get into today's story. Classes began at Drexel University in Philadelphia on the morning of November 30th, 1984, students walking into Randall Hall made a gruesome discovery. Crumpled at the bottom of an outdoor stairwell, underneath a gray jacket was the body of a young woman. She had cuts and bruising all over her face, and she had a deep purple line that went all around her neck from where she had been strangled to death. She had no purse, no backpack, nothing to identify her. There was no evidence of sexual assault because she was fully clothed, although she was missing her shoes and socks. Police immediately cordoned off the area. Their first suspicion was this was a robbery that turned deadly. But right away, the police knew they were in for a very difficult investigation because one, there were no cameras inside or outside of Randall Hall, so they couldn't just review the footage to see what happened to Debbie. And two, there was a virtually unlimited number of suspects because Drexler University was not an isolated campus. It's Why were there no cameras? I guess it's from 1984. So, probably guess cameras weren't a thing. I'm gonna assume. Um, good thing we have cameras now in today's society. People don't use cameras now just like thinking at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, just walking in your first day of s starting classes and you find a girl's body underneath a stairwell. That's got to be disturbing and make you out of school then, doesn't it? You don't probably want to finish the school day after that. Jesus. Its buildings were integrated into West Philadelphia, and Randall Hall itself was located right along a known cut-through that residents that lived in and around Drexler would use almost every single day. And it was clear this young woman had not been killed in this stairwell. She had been killed elsewhere and then dragged a great distance, losing her shoes in the process before being dumped at this spot. 
But just a couple of hours after the body was discovered, the police received a lucky break when a young man who was combative and frantic rushed the closed off crime scene and demanded he be let through because he said he knew the identity of the dead girl. The police were immediately suspicious because they didn't even know who this dead girl was. So they pull the young man aside and they interview him and he tells police his name is Kurt Rayner, he's a student at Drexel University, and he believes the girl they had found, the dead girl, was his girlfriend, 20 year old Debbie Wilson, who was also a student. And then he proceeded to give police a very long and complicated explanation of how he figured out the girl inside was his girlfriend. He said the night before he was with Debbie in Randall Hall in the computer lab in the basement. He said Debbie he had a big project that was due the next day and that he had offered to just keep her company while she Dude, saying you were there is the worst mistake you could have made. Now you just made yourself prime suspect. The moment you said you were there, you said you were the prime suspect. If they don't look at you as prime suspect, then please show again that they're stupid, which you seem to see a lot of here on in videos. But this is another just easy, dramatic, like, situation of that, because what the hell? She worked. But by about 1.30 in the morning, Debbie still had a lot of work to do, and Kurt said he was just really tired and didn't know if he could stay awake any longer, and so he asked Debbie if it would be okay if he took off early. Debbie said it was totally fine. She was used to working late at this computer lab, and Kurt, even though he wanted to stick around and walk her safely to her car when she was done, he felt like she was okay, and so he took off on his own. On his walk back to the dorm, Kurt said he passed by a campus security guard, and he actually asked him if he wouldn't mind checking on his girlfriend in the computer lab because she was all alone and it was late and the security guard said no problem I'll make sure she's okay. The next morning when Kurt woke up he heard rumors from other students on campus about a woman's body being found just outside of Randall Hall and that apparently it looked like murder. Kurt said he didn't think much of it at first but that day when he went into campus to meet up with Debbie he saw her car still parked in the computer lab parking lot looking like it had never left and then when he got to the meeting site Debbie never showed. And he said it was at that point that he realized the dead woman in Randall Hall must be Debbie. And he wasn't wrong, it was Debbie. But the police were not buying his story. He was the last person to see Debbie alive, and by his own admonition, he had heard that morning about a dead woman being found at Randall Hall, the very place he had left his girlfriend the night before all alone. But it took him hours to bring this up to anyone? The police all Told you. He made himself a night line suspect. I'm not saying he's innocent. He might be the prime suspect. He might be the guy who did it. But fuck bro. You don't put yourself under the bus like that, man. Stupid people do stupid things. Also noticed he had bruises All stupid people say stupid things. on his knuckles and a deep cut between his fingers. Suddenly Kurt seemed like the killer. And this crime that initially looked like a robbery gone wrong now looked like something much more personal. Strangulation is intimate. The killer almost always is face to face with their victim and it takes a lot of time and a lot of rage. And afterwards, the killer had covered Debbie's body with her jacket, an act that indicated remorse or even respect. And investigators know that generally when a woman is murdered, her romantic partner is the culprit. Instead of tipping off Kurt that they were looking at him as the primary suspect, they told him to go back to his dorm room and they would be in touch with him as the investigation developed. In the meantime, investigators turned their attention to the computer lab in Randall Hall, where Kurt said Debbie had been last. Debbie had logged into a computer at the front of the lab but had not logged out. Her computer cursor was left blinking mid-sentence at 1.38 a.m., leading investigators to- Have we not checked the security guard too? Because if there is a security guard there, he should also be seen as a suspect. I'm just saying believe she was interrupted by her attacker inside of the lab. Investigators found two extension cords on the ground near this computer that matched the ligature marks on Debbie's neck. They also found a small spot of blood on the back of Debbie's chair that they sent off for testing. As police swept the computer lab, they began commenting on how neat everything looked, considering that there must have been some sort of death struggle that took place in there. And that's when they realized there had been a huge setback in this case. The janitor that morning had cleaned the computer lab and the hall right outside, likely destroying critical physical evidence. They interviewed the janitor who had a rock solid alibi and was incredibly remorseful at unintentionally destroying the crime scene. And so they asked the janitor. Yeah, because I'm gonna assume that the, jan that the janitor just saw a messy computer lab and just decided, 
oh, I gotta clean this up. She wouldn't have looked at that and gone, oh no, I gotta do a murder. Like, I clean, there's a crime scene I need to keep. Like, you wouldn't think that way. So, I, it's under, considering it was done by strangulation, it's not like there's blood everywhere. It's understandable why she, the janitor did not see that case, did not see that happen. Before you cleaned it up, was there anything strange about the computer lab or the hallway right outside of the computer lab? And the janitor said, no, it was all normal, but she did say it looked like the tables and chairs had been moved around inside of the computer lab, but it didn't stand out to her because it always looked that way when she went in to clean it up. Because the police lacked physical evidence, they couldn't just go arrest Kurt, even though they wanted to. And so instead, they asked him if he'd be willing to come down to the station for a formal interview, and he said he would. During the interview, Kurt insisted he had nothing to do with Debbie's death. As for the bruises and cut on his hand, he said he had punched a wall after finding out what had happened to Debbie, and the cut in the middle of his fingers was from working on his car. But neither of those things could be proven. After this interview yielded no new results, and they still had no evidence on Kurt, they told told him he could go, and in the interim, they began digging into his alibi. Kurt had previously told police that after leaving Debbie in the computer lab, on his walk back to his dorm, he had passed a security guard and asked that security guard to check on Debbie. And so the police were able to track down that security guard who confirmed Kurt's alibi. The security guard's name was Bryce Clapman, who was a longtime employee of Drexler University with a stellar work record and no criminal history. Clapman said he spoke with Kurt around 1.30 in the morning as Kurt was walking back towards the dorms. After speaking with Kurt, Clapman radioed Bronson Ziegler, who was one of the two security guards that were working in Randall Hall that night, and he told him that he or the other guy, David Dixon, would need to go down into the basement and check on this girl. Shortly after radioing Ziegler, Clapman would say he saw a person, presumably a student, come out of Randall Hall. He said he was just too far away and it was too dark that he couldn't make out any features, but he definitely saw someone walk around the premise around 1.30 in the morning. Clapman told police he never stepped foot inside of Randall Hall that night and that he was willing to take a lie detector test. Police ran the backgrounds of Bronson Ziegler and David Dixon. Dixon was a military veteran with a pristine record who was still in the Army Reserves. As for Ziegler, he had spent time in jail for burglary and had actually lied about it to get his job as a security guard. When police interviewed Ziegler, he was evasive and frustrated, and he said that he did receive the message from Clapman to go check on the girl, but he didn't feel like doing it himself, so he radioed Dixon and said he should go do it. Ziegler insisted he had done his rounds properly and he had never stepped foot inside of the computer lab. He told detectives they could check his security guard clock that he carried with him every time he did rounds, which was basically like a punch card where there was designated stations along his security rounds where he would punch this card that stamped a time that he had arrived at that station. And so over the course of the night, he would punch his card at each of these stations and there was a record of what time he arrived and what time he left. And so when they checked this record, it showed that Ziegler had hit all all the stations at the correct time. But that didn't mean he didn't kill her, because there was lots of time in between rounds that he could have attacked her. Towards the end of the interview, Ziegler accused detectives of messing with him, and then he sarcastically said he had killed Debbie, and then he refused to take a lie detector test. When the police interviewed Dixon... This guy is... This guy shouldn't be doing this, bro. Don't you, when you're in an interview, you can't take things personally. Especially this. You can't take them questioning you personally this personally um you just go along with it and once you go along with it it'll all be good don't question it because once you question it, it'll all go haywire and he said that Ziegler had never radioed him asking him to check on the girl in the computer lab. However, he did say he was aware of someone working late in the computer lab because around 2.15 in the morning he had walked past and the lights were on and he heard the sound of printers working inside. And so not wanting to disturb whoever was in there, he didn't even poke his head in. He just figured he would come back in a couple hours and make sure they were gone. And so over the next couple of hours, he chatted on the phone with his girlfriend and then around four in the morning, he went back down to the computer lab and the lights were off and the door was locked. And so he figured whoever had been in there had finished up and left and Ziegler had locked up after them. When asked why he or Ziegler had not discovered Debbie's body, he said their security rounds did not leave the building. And so that stairwell was considered outside of the building and so they never would have seen her. 
At this point, Clapman and Dixon were ruled out as suspects, but Ziegler became a primary suspect. But just as with the boyfriend, Kurt Rayner, there was no physical evidence tying Ziegler to the crime, and so they couldn't arrest him. Investigators decided instead to try to track down that person Clapman had seen walking around Randall Hall around 1.30 in the morning after speaking with Kurt and after radioing Ziegler. It would turn out to be 28-year-old PhD student Ashlyn Bearhard, who was known for keeping long hours and was also known for sneaking up behind the female secretaries that worked in his office and suddenly holding a pencil up to their neck and threatening to kill them. His office also happened to That's messed up. be directly above where Debbie's body was ultimately found inside of that stairwell. When interviewed by police, Ashland said he had been in Randall Hall the night Debbie had been killed, but didn't know Debbie, had no interaction with her, and didn't leave his office the whole night. He quickly agreed to take a lie detector test, but he failed it. Scrambling to explain it, he named two other students that were in the office with him that could be his alibi. But when police spoke to these two other students, they said, no, Ashlyn was not in the office the whole time. He left around one in the morning and was gone for about three hours. He said he was going. You can't know, you can't know, you idiot. You can't give people alibis. You can't name students for your alibis when you know they're not gonna come back your story. They're actually there. If they're actually there, they're gonna tell them that you left for three hours. Cause you left for three hours. Just say you left. What a more going to take a nap. When the police approached Ashland with this information, he said, oh, you know what? I forgot to tell you about my nap. Yes, I left for a few hours. I stepped outside for a breath of fresh air, went back inside and slept in one of the study hall rooms. But besides that, I was inside of that building for a full 24 hours and I never saw Debbie. I had no interaction with her. It's just coincidence that my nap coincided with when she was killed. But detectives were not buying it. They believed wholeheartedly that now, finally, they had found their killer. But just like with Kurt and with Ziegler, they had no physical evidence tying Ashland to the crime, and so they couldn't arrest him. And because they were not able to make any arrests, the police just continued to look for more suspects. And so they began speaking to some of Debbie's friends and acquaintances, and it came out that Debbie actually had a stalker. It was another student named Alan Smith, who had previously been one of Debbie's very close friends, but at some point he wanted to take the relationship from platonic to romantic, and Debbie rejected him. Alan apparently didn't take this very well and took to following Debbie around campus, trying to get her to stop and talk to him and try to reconcile their relationship but Debbie every time would just say no, and Alan got increasingly more angry about it, and just the day before Debbie was killed, their friends saw Debbie fighting with Alan in the middle of campus where Alan had actually grabbed her shoulder and was shaking her and yelling at her. Police tracked down Alan, and he was cooperative and said he did not kill Debbie, but he didn't have an alibi. He just said he was alone in his apartment on the night that Debbie was killed. And so like all the other primary suspects in this case, there was no physical evidence tying Alan to the crime, and so they couldn't make an arrest. Around what they need to do, okay, here's the thing. I get the fact that they want to get as many suspects as they can. I understand this. But because you don't have enough physical evidence, to arrest a suspect doesn't mean you should go looking for a new one. Like that new one isn't going to have evidence randomly if the other ones don't. That's just because that's not how it works. Um, they'll look, they're trying to, I, the way of trying to do this is just off. Around this time, the lab that tested the blood spatter that was on Debbie's chair inside of the computer lab came back with their results. DNA profiling was not available back then, so all they could provide was blood type. The blood type that came back from that little spot was type A, and Debbie's blood was type O, meaning this blood spot likely belonged to Debbie's killer, who during their struggle must have gotten wounded and then bled on the chair. And so right away, the police got Kurt Rayner, Bronson Ziegler, Ashlyn Bearhard, and Alan. Kurt has a cut on his arm. It's the boyfriend. He's right now number one suspect. And Smith to all come in and provide a blood sample, and they figured if any one of them was type A, that they probably were the killer. But unbelievably, when their test results came back in, none of them were type A. It was what? A Never mind. I was wrong. I was. I saw the cut thing, and I was like, oh, well, it's clearly that. Nope. Never mind. Never mind.
crushing blow to the investigation. The first few days after Debbie's killing seemed so full of promising leads, but now with this blood type development, investigators had no suspects, and all of a sudden the Drexel community was starting to panic. Students were outraged at the light security and wondered why the security guards were not allowed to carry weapons. The administration put up a $10,000 reward for any information about who could have done this, and the president of the university told students to use the buddy system and never be alone on campus because he believed the killer was one of us. No one could understand why anyone would want to target Debbie in the first place. She seemed like such a wonderful person that was nice to everyone. She had modeled in high school, but she wasn't vain. She'd actually turned down getting braces because she was worried it might affect her clarinet playing. She was an average student, but she had an uncommon drive. She worked really hard to get good grades. Whenever she was feeling down or wasn't feeling motivated, she would stare at a picture of a Mercedes-Benz car that was there to inspire her and remind her what she could achieve if she continued to work hard. When she was killed, that picture of the Mercedes-Benz still hung above her desk. It was ultimately her work ethic that put her in danger because she was prepared to stay at that computer lab as long as it took to make sure her project was perfect. The few pieces of physical evidence the police had didn't fit together. The crime wasn't really a robbery. While she was missing her shoes and socks, her backpack had turned up at the campus lost and found about a week later, and no one knows how it got there or who put it there. Inside, it appeared all of her belongings were still there. Also, when she was discovered, she was still wearing her expensive watch. Her murder looked personal, but the police could not prove that someone who actually knew her was the one who killed her. Police considered a few other suspects, but like all the others, there wasn't enough evidence to make any arrests, and so eventually, Debbie's case went cold. In 1985, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran a story about unsolved cases that most haunted detectives, and Debbie's was one of them. Some of the detectives that were involved in the case said they believed this was a random killing and that the killer would most likely strike again. Debbie's case eventually disappeared from headlines and it languished for eight years. And then, in the spring of 1992, Debbie's murder was assigned to a cold case squad led by Detective Bob Snyder. And desperate to crack the case, Snyder threw a Hail Mary. He took the case to the VDOC Society, which is a private and highly selective club of geniuses from all walks of criminology. Homicide detectives, prosecutors, defense attorneys, FBI agents, forensic scientists, even an aeronautic physicist. They came from all over the world for these monthly closed door sessions where they would talk about these unsolvable cases and try to solve them. So in one of their monthly closed door sessions, Detective Snyder stood in front of the VDOC Society and laid out the details of Debbie Wilson's murder. Then he opened the floor to questions, and for hours the society got nowhere. Then Richard Walter, who was a founding member of the society, said that he had a theory. Walter was a famous criminal psychologist who had profiled some of the world's most infamous killers. Most of his work is actually still confidential. He believed the killer was a power assertive, macho type guy that liked being in control. Walter pointed to one clue that detectives and everyone seemed to have overlooked after all these years, and that was Debbie's missing shoes. He said the missing shoes were not random. They were the most important clue. The killer, Walter predicted, was a foot fetishist. Detective Snyder had nothing else to go on, and he was really intrigued by this idea, so he brought the information back to the cold case squad, and they began re-interviewing everybody involved in the case. When they spoke with the manager of the computer lab at Randall Hall, he told them he was always bothered by one particular detail. The printers in the lab always turned off after 10 p.m., and so he was always confused how the security guard, David Dixon, could have heard the sound of printers inside the lab at 2.15 in the morning like he claimed. Detectives were shocked. Somehow, no one had picked up on this discrepancy. They began looking more closely at David Dixon, who had been ruled out as a suspect and was viewed by and large as this pristine military veteran with no criminal history, and they dug all the way to the back of his military file where they discovered in 1979, the first year he was in the service, he had gotten in trouble for stealing another soldier's white Reebok sneakers, the exact type of shoe that Debbie was known to wear. Police began interviewing Dixon's former and current neighbors, and at least four women reported having a break-in when Dixon was living next to them, and the only thing missing was their white sneakers and dirty socks, although none of these women actually ever found out who was responsible. When they raided Dixon's apartment, they found in one of his closets 20 sets of used women's white shoes that were all wrapped in plastic like they were trophies. They also found 77 homemade videos, presumably shot by Dixon, that are just filming the feet of women walking around.
found in white shoes. Dixon's alibi on the night that Debbie was killed was that most of the time he was on the phone with his girlfriend. His girlfriend had become his wife and then she became his ex-wife. And so when detectives spoke to her, she told them that they had only spoke for a couple of minutes that night, not for a couple of hours. Police arrested Dixon in June of 1993 and he never admitted to anything, but as soon as he got into his cell, he started bragging to his cellmate about how he had killed Debbie because he wanted to have his way with her feet and his cellmate immediately told on him. Dixon was ultimately found guilty of killing Debbie Wilson and he was sentenced to life in prison. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found these secrets I knew it was a security guard. I called that sh Good old security guard. Never can be trusted. <sighs> Saying the weirdness of people, isn't it? The fact that people can do that to this woman who's sitting there working hard, minding her own business, and this weird ass dude does that to her. All because he has a weird obsession with feet. The weirdness of people, that's all I'm saying. Ladies and gentlemen, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I hope. Hope y'all enjoyed this reaction video. I missed those two lines up. Hope y'all enjoyed this reaction video. Hit the like button and subscribe button. Comment what you think of this story down below. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you for the next one.